live right now. Picture here, everyone. <laughs> Quite a lovely group, if I may say so. <laughs> All right, we, we're live on Facebook. And I think we can let everybody in if everyone's ready. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna... Good evening, my name is Amy Russo. On behalf of the JPP <laughs> Steering Committee, we welcome you to tonight's very important forum. We hope that hearing from the candidates tonight will help you decide which four candidates you will cast your vote for on September 14th. The eight candidates that receive the most votes will be on the ballot on the November 2nd. Tonight, Spanish and Cantonese interpretation is available to turn it on click on the world icon at the bottom of the screen and select your preferred language. If you are in an app on a phone, uh, on an iPhone or a tablet, click on the three dots and select language in the menu. If you are on a web browser or a Chromebook, you cannot listen to the interpretation. We will also be using closed caption. We wish to thank the Cantonese interpreters, Wei Quin Tay and Yu Sin Mok and the Spanish interpret interpreters, Jessarara Burroughs and Nicholas Magnolia. This forum is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. We ask the audience to be respectful when posting in chat. Please do not engage in harassing, discriminatory, and intimidating behavior that stifles debate and constructive dialogue. Before we bring on the candidates, I want to tell you a little bit about Jamaica Plain Progressives. Since 2009, JPP has been working to build a progressive voice in our community and organize for change in Boston, Massachusetts and nationwide. We conduct candidate forums and organize to support progressive candidates at all levels of government from city council to president. In addition, we hold educational forums and advocate for progressive change in our state on issues such as criminal justice reform, equitable education funding, safe communities for immigrants, progressive revenue and transparency in government. We are the clipboard holders, door knockers, and question askers for progressive values in our community. And now join me in welcoming Wendell Bishop, who will tell you a little more about the other co-sponsors. Thank you, Annie. Uh, my name is Wendell Bishop. I chair the NAACP's Political Action Committee. Welcome to JP Progressive's Boston City Council at Large Candidate Forum. There are a large number of active and talented candidates who are stepping out on faith in hopes of representing you as one of the four at-large Boston City Councilors. I'd like to thank JP Progressives for leading in this effort to ensure that the electorate is informed and engaged. Additionally, I appreciate JPP's willingness to share the spotlight in this endeavor by cooperating with the Boston Education Justice Alliance, Chinese Progressive Political Action, Mi Gente, NAACP Boston Branch, and Right to the City Vote. This is a real life example of one of my favorite adages, many hands make for light work. Finally, I appreciate all of you taking the time out of your schedules to engage in the political process. As volunteers, activists, and advocates, you make this work worthwhile and rewarding. So thanks again. Uh, okay. Since we had so many great candidates coming out to run this year for city council, we've had a break tonight's evening into two parts, each lasting an hour. So we've split that. So in the first part, we have six candidates and the second part, we have six candidates, but they're gonna to respond to an identical program of questions. And so first I'll introduce you to who the six candidates are. We're gonna start off with Saeed Abdikarim, Kelly Bates, Michael Flaherty, uh, Ruthie Louis Jen, Carla Montero, and uh, Nick Vance. And then the second hour, we go with James Coleman, uh, 
Dominguez Dos, Dos Santos, uh, Alex Gray, David Halbert, Julia Mejia, and then Aaron Murphy. Uh, so those will be our two hours. And so the format we've devised is we're gonna have five subject matters that we felt were the most important issues for the city council would be candidates to answer. Uh, the first of those is going to be education. The second will be housing. The third will be police. The fourth will be workers and uh, the equitable economy. And the fifth will be uh, democracy, fittingly. Uh, and so we have a little bit of wrinkle in the format. We wanted it to be the most revealing for the candidates and the voters. So what we're doing tonight is we're, we're beginning each of those five sections with, the, with two to three lightning round questions, which means the candidates will be asked a question and then requested to give a yes or no answer. And then after that, we'll go into what we call a deep dive question in that subject area where the candidates will have more freedom to expand on their views. Uh, and, and you know that's really uh, our program for tonight. And so what I'm gonna do is hand you over to my co-moderator, uh, Melissa Beltran, who's also our youth moderator, and she's gonna tell you about how the timing will work in detail. Melissa, take it away. Thank you, Ed. My name is Melissa Beltran. Um, I'm part of the Reclaim Roxbury Civics team, also with JP Progressive. I'm so happy to be with all of you guys here. So yes, um, the first part, we are going to have a lightning round, which candidates are going to have a chance to just pick yes or no, and following up with um, a deeper dive set of questions, um, which we're going to be using for the two parts. I believe, if I'm correct, Ed, is Jonathan going to start us off with the questions or? Yeah, and there will be one minute of an opening statement, and then at the end of the five sections, one minute closing statement. Mm -hmm. And Jonathan will go first, Melissa, that's correct. Yeah. He's going to cover education. So we're going to start with the opening statements now. So Melissa, you just want to get them into their opening statements. Just invite them to do that. Give me one second. So we, this gives the candidates extra time to think, to get ready their best opening statement of the whole campaign. No pressure. <laughs> and so, Melissa, they really do all the work for this one. We just open the floor for them and then they'll. Ed, why don't you go ahead and um, get them started? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Saeed, would you like to begin? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor and privilege to be part of this forum. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's an honor to be among great candidates who bring different skills and experiences. I wish all the best to all of you, and I look forward to learning from you and hopefully working together. Looking back at my life 27 years ago, being resettled in this great city as a refugee, I remember selling newspapers to support my family in Africa at the intersection of MLK Boulevard and Warren Street. At that time, as an English learner, I was not able to pronounce Dr. King's name. However, as I went through school in Boston, from elementary to middle to high school, I, I learned about Dr. King's life and legacy. And one thing that really stuck with me was when he said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Having the opportunity to work for and hold a leadership position in tech and business for Harvard University, Fidelity Investment and Apple. For the past six years, I worked with Boston Public Schools and community organizations. Okay, the, the time ran out on that one. Thanks, Saeed. And we're gonna keep it in alphabetical order by last name, the order you were sort of introduced. So Kelly, you're next. Thank you. 
Thank you for inviting me here tonight. I'm so honored to be here. I've worked with so many of the organizations and the people that are on this call tonight. My priorities are directly influenced by my life and what I've been able to achieve in my career. I believe we have to have vision for this moment. We have to repair our economy. We have to recover from this crisis and we can reimagine a better and more equitable future. I have three priorities. There'll be many I want to work on with you, but we have to work toward affordable housing, racial justice and jobs with livable wages. And I know this is possible because with this community and other advocates, I and so many others have been able to recover from housing insecurity, from economic hardships and the stains of racism that we face every day. I remember my mother counting quarters on the living room table and wondering if we could make rent that month. I didn't even know what a mortgage was when I went to law school. We have people in the city who cannot afford to live here. Ultimately, my mother passed away from racism and sexism before I could even introduce her to my child. And that's what most Yep. Thanks, Kelly. The time the time ran out. I think Melissa, are you ready? Do you want to take it over? Okay. Thank you, Ed. All righty. And we are going to follow up with Michael Flaherty. Sorry, Thank you and good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Flaherty. I'm currently your at-large city councilor, uh, proud uh, husband and father of four, lifelong resident of the city and deeply committed to the city of Boston. Uh, when I was first elected to the city council, uh, Annie Russo will tell you, I ushered in a, a new era of uh, progressive leadership in the city council that was at the time an aging body and now joined by many progressive voices and votes. So uh, my approach all along has been one of uh, forward thinking and inclusive and also uh, have lots of firsts. The uh, first uh, citywide elected officials was what marriage equality long before the Goodrich decision. And it wasn't ex politically expedient to do so. First to support Preservation Act, first to change the linkage formula and have an adjustment that hadn't been done uh, since its inception in 1983. My record on issues and legislations demonstrates how effective I am in bringing different coalitions, stakeholders and individuals together. And my commitment to advancing uh, equitable and forward looking Boston city government remains strong. I'm running for re-election because I continue to believe that Boston's greatest years will be uh, are in front of them. And given coming out of the pandemic uh, and new leadership, uh, mayor's race and uh, five, at least five new councilors joining three only in their first term. At this All righty. Thank you so much, Michael. Next, we have Rootsy Luigian. You may go. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for allowing me to he be here. My name is Ruth C. Louis Jean. I'm a proud daughter of Haitian immigrants who came here uh, looking for a better life. Grew up in Mattapan and High Park, proud graduate of Boston Public Schools, graduated from Harvard Law School, represented tenants and uh, homeowners facing eviction and foreclosure in Boston Housing Court. So see firsthand, saw firsthand the role of displacement in our communities and the need for affordable housing. I care about uh, making the city more affordable. Um, went on and graduated from Harvard Law School, worked on voting rights redistricting um, and, and progressive causes such as uh, criminal justice reform. I've um, worked for Senator Warren as her top attorney on her campaigns. For the last year, I've been working on home ownership affordability. My top issue issues are affordable, affordable housing, both housing and home ownership, um, education. I reject the idea that we have to choose between equity and excellence in our schools. We can have all and economic opportunity. That means green union jobs that pay a living wage. That means more contracts for our Black and Latinx businesses. Thank you for being for giving me this time. Thank you so much, Rootsy. And next, we have Carla Montero. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. My name is Carla Montero. I use she, her pronouns, and my campaign is rooted in my own um, lived experience and informed by my career as a social worker, as well as my background as a community advocate. I'm the daughter of Cape Verdean immigrants, a Dorchester native, and the mother of the most amazing son. Um, and I'm running for Boston City Council to achieve a better Boston for my son and for my community. My campaign is focused on meeting the basic needs of every resident, and that includes ensuring that every family has a pathway to housing rather than to displacement and investing in equitable education for every child in Boston 
and, and one that sets them on track for a more prosperous future and providing wraparound services for people with mental illness and substance use disorder rather than stigmatizing and isolating them. What has made me a successful social worker will make me an effective city councilor, listening, identifying needs and connecting people to services. I am so excited for the opportunity to be here today and um, thank you again for having me. This is when being a fast talker um, is, it works today. <laughs> Yeah, you guys are killing it. Um, and next we have Nick Vance. Thank you so much. And I appreciate being here with you all today. My name is Nick Vance. I'm, uh, I'm, it's an honor to be here. I've been born and raised in the city of Boston. I was raised in a family that believed in service and has worked in service our entire lives. Uh, I have started as a young kid working in food pantries all the way to uh, representing NAACP as a political action co-chair, uh, dealing with issues of body cams, uh, and also dealing with gang violence and gang prevention, working on the ground with inner city teens, working on how we can make this city more equitable uh, through affordable housing, uh, and really making sure that our community through this pandemic, one, can survive the pandemic, but also ensure that, as we mentioned earlier here, we, we have better uh, And I think that uh, has really just shined a bright light, uh, COVID, on all the major inequities that the city has already been facing. And, and, I, and it's an honor to be here and I hope to represent everyone here. Great, thank you so much, Nick. We are now wrapping up with introductions and we are moving um, into the yes or no um, questions. Jonathan is gonna take it over from here. All right, thank you so much, Melissa. Um, and so our first topic y'all and our first lightning round is about the very important topic of education in our city. Um, so a little bit about the lightning round, I'm going to ask questions um, and it will be a yes or no, not a maybe, not a half, not a almost a yes or no, and they are going to be Zoom with, a, with the Zoom reactions. I'm going to ask candidates to check their reaction buttons right now. You'll have a little, a little uh, check green mark uh, or X red mark uh, for no. Um, and then I will, I will read out, thank you, Michael. Um, and then I will read out uh, uh, the answers for, for, uh, for the audience and folks will also screenshot it for folks that might've missed it. Um, and so it'll be, we'll try to be as effective as we can on our lightning rounds from now on. And so here we go. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Councillor Michael, if you can un unreact real quick so that, uh, there you go. Thank you so much. And then, so our first lightning round question is, do you support making permanent the interim plan for exam school admissions um, implemented during COVID? All right, uh, we see uh, Kelly Bates, Nick Vance, Carla Montero, yes. Rutsi, Lujan, Saeed Abdikaram, and Michael Flaherty, no. Thank you so much. The next question. Next question is: um, Do you support uh, do you support a change to the school committee that would give the youth representative both a vote and a stipend? All right. The record shows all candidates um, say yes. Thank you. And now we have our in depth question. Um, and this is a, a question where candidates will have one minute each. Uh, we'll start with Kelly Bates as we started with, we started alphabet order in our introductions uh, and we'll rotate one out. So now we'll start with Kelly Bates and go down the list and Saeed will be our last candidate to answer. I will of course remind folks of the order. Um, our in-depth question, uh, our first question here is, Boston's the only municipality in the state that does not have an elected school committee. Do you support a fully elected school committee? What system would you support? Um, please, Kelly. Yes, I do support a fully elected school committee. I've been one of the few people to say that and say that strongly. I'd like to see parents, I'd like to see youth on that committee and people who are invested in our kids and our schools. My child has been in the Boston public schools since he was born and has gone all the way up through the public schools. And I think it's very important that we have a diverse group of people, representative and being on the voice of the school committee and holding our entire city accountable to progressive education and policies. Thank you. Uh, Michael, Michael Flaherty. 
Yes, I'm on record uh, since the day I joined the Boston City Council of supporting an elected school committee and also on record of supporting uh, the students uh, uh, representative uh, the right to vote and receive a stipend. I think that at the end of the day for us, uh, they're more accountable to the people of Boston, but uh, when you're thinking about parents uh, and students as our consumers and also teachers, uh, particularly frontline teachers, having input in the ability uh, to interact and to, um, and to work closely with their elected um, school committee members, I think it'd make a huge difference uh, in uh, policy and in moving our schools forward. Thank you. Next, we have Ruth C. Lujan. Hi. Uh, yes, I support a fully elected school committee. I also support a committee where the student is given a uh, stipend and voting rights. I also think there should be another student. I think there should be two students. Having been a student on a committee in City Hall, it can be a very lonely and isolating experience, especially if the adults don't value your voice. So it's important for there to be another student on, stu on, on, on school committee so that, that th those students can feel the strength of each other in the process of advocating for what their schools look like as a Boston Public School graduate myself. Um, I know that that's important. And also just to highlight on the exam school question, we have a great task force right now that's working on what uh, admissions should look like to the exam schools in the future. And so I entrust them with the ability, they've been doing great work. They implemented the policy this year and they're going to have a framework for us going forward. So that's what I wanna see. I wanna see what the task force recommends because they've been doing great work already on that issue. Thank you. Next we have Carla Montero. Hi, I would start off um, supporting a, a hybrid model and then um, moving and then having more discussion about moving over to an elected, a fully elected committee. Um, as a first time candidate running, I know how challenging it can be um, for from a financial perspective and in, in raising funds. And so I think that, um, you know, we want to explore that a little bit more to ensure more diversity um, in, clar in clarifying um, campaign finance and also, you know, protecting the students, protecting them, giving them votes um, on the voting rights. And so, um, so that's where I am at with it right now. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Next, we have Nick Vance. Yes. Yeah, so I'm I'm completely supportive, 100% uh, of having a fully elected uh, school committee. Uh, I think it's long overdue. Uh, I, I've worked for Metco Inc. and done work with BPS over the years. And I know this has been a long and ongoing conversation. Uh, there needs to be more accountability, and that is through elections. Uh, I also have served on multiple boards where there is adults and youth. Uh, I actually really agree with Rootsy. We really need to make sure that there are adequate supports uh, for our young people if uh, while they have a vote, because we want to make sure they do not feel alienated and do not feel like they are the other uh, on these committees. So uh, I'm fully committed to a youth also having a vote because they're on the ground. We should listen to youth more often, to be quite honest. Thank you, Nick. And finally, Saeed Abdikaram. Kareem, sorry. Oh, thank you. As a former uh, Boston Public School student and as a uh, ESL learner, and for the past six years working with students in Boston Public Schools, I do hear um, you know, the concerns and issues when it comes to our education. Um, I am for a hybrid model, um, elected um, and appointed uh, school committee. I'm also for um, students having a vote and a stipend. Thank you. Um, so that concludes our education section. Um, and next we have housing. I believe with Melissa, take it away. Great, thank you. So again, this is just um, yes or no question. So the first question is, do you support rent control? Yes or no, just make some notes. Right. Next question. Do you support the renewal of Boston's condo conver converse conversion law, excuse me, which affords residents of covered properties a notice period, right of first refusal to purchase their unit, relocation assistance, just cause just cause eviction, the relocation benefits if their unit is converted to a condominium. I'll read that again. That was pretty lengthy. 
do you support the renewal of Boston's condo conversion law, which affords residents of covered properties a notice period right of the first refusal to purchase their unit, relocation assistance, just cause eviction and relocation benefits if their unit is converted to a condominium, yes or no? Melissa, can you can you acknowledge the the answers for for the audience there? Oh yes, I'm sorry. May you guys put your answers one more time? I was writing them down. So Nick Van says yes. Carla Montero says yes. Kelly Bates says yes. Ruthie Lujan says yes. Said Adbi Karim says yes. Michael Flaherty says yes. Next question. Would you support a tenant opportunity to purchase ordinance enabling tenants, tenants wish to remain to purchase a building if the owner seeks to put it on the market? Kelly Bates says yes. Nick Vance says yes. Carla Montero says yes. Ruth C. Lujern says yes. Saeed Abdekarim also says yes. Would you like me to read the question? Okay. And Michael Flaherty also says yes. Next question, do you support requiring that a majority of new affordable units be built on site in order to ensure communities are diverse and integrated? Carla Montero says yes. Saeed Abdekarim says yes. Ruth Z. Lujern says yes. Kelly Bates says yes. Michael Flatter Flaherty says yes. And Nick Vance, I'm sorry, I don't know if I got your answer. Did you also? And Nick Vance says yes. And this, we are going into a deep dive. We are still in the housing um, section. If you had to prioritize one policy to address our affordable housing crisis, what would it be? And Michael Flaherty, you may go first. Sure, thank you. Uh, it's probably be the one that when I join the council, which is the linkage formula, increasing our linkage formula uh, to make sure that uh, we're up to standards. When I joined the council in 2000, um, linkage was uh, created in 1983 uh, and hadn't even been given a cost of living adjustment. Tens of millions of dollars and more were left uh, on the table that uh, we could have put uh, to work, uh, not only uh, putting people in homes, but also putting people uh, on the job building those homes. So uh, I've been a long time uh, supporter, making sure that we continue to advance the linkage formula to make sure that it's reflective uh, on up to date uh, schedules and up to date uh, economics. And so That'll be the one. I think it's had the biggest impact. I mean, uh, it's not um, sort of the the one um, sort of the cure all, but um, when we think about all the things we're doing to create more affordable housing and to stabilize our city so that we don't become the city of the very rich and the very poor, I seem to think that linkages have the biggest and greatest impact. Amazing. All righty, Ruthie Louie Jen, you are up next. Hi, picking one is hard. Linkage is a good one. Another really great one is inclusionary development policy right now, which has been stagnant at 13% when our neighboring cities are at least at 20%. Let's be clear that an IDP of 13% for new market constructions is a displacement policy. You are ensuring that folks are getting displaced if all you're requiring uh, folks to build is 13% affordable housing. And that 13% affordable housing, there's no adjustment for AMI by neighborhood, right? So an area median income for the, when you're based off the entire city looks different in the South End than it does in Dorchester and in Mattapan. So we totally need to look at our inclusionary development policy and reinstitute best practices. That means bringing that up, requiring that, um, requiring that the affordable, affordable units are um, happening on site to prevent um, to, to prevent essentially segregated neighborhoods like you see um, in the seaport. And you wanna make sure that folks are able to, um, that, we're, that folks in the neighborhoods are able to meet the AMI requirements. So IDP fixing that so it's anti-displacement. Thank you. Carla Montero. 
Thank you. Um, I support, um, you know, supporting residents' housing goals. So whatever that means, if that's a pathway to renting an affordable apartment or buying a home. Um, when I was growing up, my family was evicted when I was four years old. And as a young mother, I was on the brink of homelessness. And so I know how devastating housing insecurity can be for families in Boston. And our neighbors are being displaced um, in the very neighborhood that they grew up in because they can't afford to live here. Um, you know, I agree with the other um, candidates and, you know, area median income is something that I want to look at so that we can adjust that because it doesn't, you know, taking into consideration Wellesley's income does not reflect Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, and East Boston. And that's something that I would like to start with and bring in community members to have more discussions about it. Thank you. Thank you. Nick Vance. Thank you so much. And I, I've been trying to tackle this issue since being on the Millennial Council with Mayor Walsh uh, some years ago. Uh, let's let's just be honest and not lose people in the weeds here. People are being pushed out of the city that they love and grew up in. Okay, at the end of the day, we need to get building. Uh, I have talked, I have been at all the forums for the 2030 project. We cannot wait that long uh, to use the money that we have got from linkage uh, to start building housing. We need to start building housing right now, right? We have the resources. There are money is already available. Uh, to make sure that we build actual affordable housing units that are in the city of Boston that are for affordable housing, right? Not a certain percentage, not a little bit here. I've talked with Cruise Construction. I've talked with Suffolk Construction. It can be done. It has been done in LA. It's been done in Chicago. We can build all affordable units that make sure if there's 10,000 people waiting right now for an affordable unit. And that is a disgrace as a city and we can do better. Saeed Abdikarim. Thank you. Um, I would agree with what uh, Ruthie said. It's very hard to uh, pick one thing, but as someone who lived in affordable housing, I would advocate to have an elected community board member as part of the uh, BPDA. Because obviously, if there are developments going up in Boston, we need to have community input, someone um, you know, from different districts of the, of, of the city of Boston to be at the table to be advocating for um, affordable housing because we do have the resources uh, to build these developments. So I'll definitely push for to have an elected uh, community board as part of uh, PBDA. And last but not least, Kelly Bates. Yeah, I was raised by a single mom who had a disability. You know, 90% of our income went to rent. And like many of you in this city, I had to move from neighborhood to neighborhood to neighborhood because I kept getting kicked out. And I think we have to be prog progressive. I think we have to be bold. We have to move for rental stabilization and rent control. We saw what happened when that was removed. And unless we remove that incentive of greed that encourages people to keep increasing rents for no, sometimes for good reasons, because some people have to build in you know, they're, they own their own home, they have one renter, costs go up. But for the most part, it just, the ceiling keeps getting higher and higher and higher. And we have to make a decision as progressives, are we gonna fight for this? And we need to, it's the only way to stop the trajectory that we're going in. Otherwise, forget it. You know, there's no way that any of us are gonna be able to stay in this city. And I want something better for my child and your children. I want something better for our families. And we should accept nothing less than that right now. This city is becoming unaffordable and it's unacceptable. Great, that is, we are coming to a close from the deep dive in housing. I am now gonna pass it over to Ed. Okay, we're gonna get into the third section now, which is policing. Uh, but I wanted to say that we have over 200 people tuning in on Zoom right now. We have hundreds more on Facebook. so you know, we're reaching a, a good size audience, which is exciting. Uh, the first lightning round question in, in policing is, do you support closing the BPD gang database? And so far we have uh, Saeed Abdikaram with no, uh, and then we have Kelly Bates is yes, uh, Michael Flaherty is no, Rusi is yes. Nick, are you, do you, are you coming? Uh, Nick is Nick is yes, and Carla is uh, is yes. So we just have, I, I believe, Mike. Mike is the is the main no right now. Is that right, Saeed? Were you yes or no? 
Okay, so Saeed and, and Michael were the two no's on that one. Okay, second question is, do you support ending information sharing be between BPD and ICE? Okay, the yeses are Kelly, Rusi, Carla, Nick, Saeed, and the and the, the one no here is is uh, is Michael Flaherty. Okay, so we've got those five. Now we got Michael Flaherty with the no there. Uh, and the third and last lightning round question: Would you advocate for the reallocation of money from the Boston Police Department budget to reinvestment in communities? Uh, so far, we got Car Carla with a yes, Saeed with a yes, Rusi with a yes, Kelly Bates with a yes, Nick Vance with a yes, and Mike. What are you thinking, Michael? Michael is going to be the no on on this issue. Okay, so that's taken us three or uh, three lightning round questions, and now we're going to get to a, a question where you get to expand on your views more, okay, and, and get to have a little more freedom. And that one is going to be giving the city council's jurisdiction over budget, but limited power over the police union contract. How would you advocate? How what would your approach be to reimagining public safety? and policing, including spending. So how would you approach it given your tools as an at-large city councilor uh, in office? And I will start off with Rusi. Hi, yes. So the city council has limited power over the budget, it's an up or down vote, but there is strength in the power of the bully pulpit. Um, we saw the city council last week hold a meeting on um, the BPD budget and hold, trying to hold the BPD accountable. And I have to give it to the advocates and the community groups that showed up. It was like a four hour um, meeting um, and, and, and they stood there, they stood and waited to give their presentation. That was data rich presentation around the role of overtime, around the what happens when you hire more police officers. So I think that there is a, a lot of power even in that up or down vote. We need to get to participatory budgeting. We need the city councils to have more of a role um, when it comes to um, how the city's money is being spent um, and for the voices of the community to also be there. But I will tell you that as a young black girl who grew up in a working class family in Mattapan, we have to find other solutions. Growing up and seeing the violence, strengthening our nonprofits. There's a correlation between more nonprofits to strengthen nonprofits and a decrease in crime. Let's invest in our nonprofits. Okay. Uh, same question for you, Carla. Thank you. Um, I believe in our collaborative approach um, to reallocating not only funds, but also the responsibilities from BPD um, and, and, and sending them over to um, train specialized responders um, in terms of responding to mental health, substance use, um, and the um, homelessness crisis. Um, so growing up in Dorchester, my community has been um, plagued with gun violence. And so I think that, you know, um, a lot of my neighbors and I are, you know, waking up at three o'clock in the morning to gunshots. And so I think that, you know, a collaborative approach with the Boston and police department um, and looking at some programs that are, you know, that they use, which is called the CAHOOTS program in Eugene Springfield. Um, in Eugene and Springfield and in Oregon is a, a perfect example of um, public sa what sub public safety can look like if we are also working together with social workers and um, at reallocating 911 calls um, to other um, responders so that we could use th those fundings for a, a city run crisis team. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Carla. Uh, Nick, it's your turn. Uh, thanks so much, Ed. Uh, I, I grew up in the inner city of Boston, playing basketball, football for the Raiders, playing uh, no books, no ball, AAU. Uh, there's a real issue around identity and culture when it comes to the relationship between police and communities. As you can imagine, I am a black man living in the inner city. Uh, I have seen it all. Uh, unfortunately, we need more community policing. Right, uh, we could talk about, I think, yes, we need to push and advocate to make sure that money is being reallocated to a lot of these type of social service programs. But in reality, we also need to focus on how policing is, act, is being approached right now, right? Sitting in your cruiser and watching kids do stuff and then just busting them is not community policing. Community policing is being deeply involved and engaged and that's how you get information. That's how you grow community wealth within the neighborhood uh, because we stopped doing that for some reason. 
And we really need to get back to that and enforcing police training around community policing and stop talking about. Okay, thanks, Nick. Uh, Saeed, you're up. All right, thank you. Um, you know, as we know, uh, the city council has limited um, you know, authority when it comes to budgeting. And from my understanding is that, you know, the, the mayor's administration submits a budget um, sometime in April and then the council must hold like a hearing to vote on it by I think sometime in June. Uh, I am for, um, you know, uh, participatory budgeting, which involves, uh, you know, uh, direct input from residents, because obviously, you know, we do need uh, police reform in the city of Boston. Uh, you know, we need to hire uh, more cadets that actually come from the neighborhoods that, he, that they're trying to represent instead of, you know, living um, outside of the city. Uh, you know, we need to have, you know, diversity um, training for police officers. And, uh, you know, we need to have a more community engaged, uh, you know, between law enforcement and, uh, and uh, the residents of Boston. Um, hopefully, you know, we can get to that. Uh, I know it's gonna take a lot of work, but I'm a numbers guy. I'm hoping to use, you know, my numbers background to crunch the numbers and see where the resources are needed. Thank you, Saeed. Uh, Kelly? Yeah, I'm the only person who's running for at large who can actually say that I've run a racial justice organization. I have trained court personnel. I have trained lawyers, judges, and police around how to actually eliminate racism from the structure and from the work. I believe we have to strengthen the internal affairs oversight panel. We have to have new membership on the civilian review board. We should do massive police-wide training every one to three years on anti-racism. We should eliminate tear gas, rubber bullets, attack dogs. Um, and we need to remove things from the police that frankly, they shouldn't be spending their time on where social workers can intervene and help our communities. And I think it's really important that we continue to forge trust between communities and with police. We have this wedge group of police officers who are police officers of color um, who are trying to do their best to do that. And we should learn from them and the lessons that they understand about how to work together around these various issues. And I would be very much in favor of, uh, you know, being an activist counselor on these issues. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, and Mike, we'll end on you. Thanks, Ed. I uh, just want to touch base. In 2014, as chair of government operations, I led the effort to usher in the Boston Trust Act. And I believe then, as I believe now, that, um, you know, that, that there are certain matters, uh, very uh, specific certain matters where uh, we need to work with federal law enforcement, including ICE, uh, including examples of uh, combating human trafficking, child exploitation, drug and weapons track tracking, as well as cybercrime. So I want to do a deeper dive on that last rapid one. As it pertains to my vision for public safety, uh, it's never been driven uh, by we need to arrest and prosecute our way through our problems. It's been more of a holistic approach, uh, and we're going to see it in this year's budget uh, for our police department priorities being reflected in, in uh, the best, best clinicians. Uh, we've heard loud and clear that uh, from both the community and the police and public health that a public response, a police response may not be required to address a a substance abuse or a mental health crisis. We also need to engage Youth Connect and our street uh, workers, as well as our Centers for Youth and Family. They can play a huge role in reducing crime and violence in partnership with our police department. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, the next co-moderator, Karen Chen. Thank you, Ed. Um, so this section will be on workers and equitable economy. Um, we all know that good jobs make strong communities. To exercise our right to wealth and good jobs in the city, we must address long-term unemployment and underemployment, substandard work, and structural inequity of the economic system, uh, ensuring access to job opportunities, improved job standards, support for small businesses, and alternative economy enterprises. And um, similar to the other sections, there'll be three lightning uh, round questions. Um, if you could wait until the screen unshares and um, show your answers, use the reaction button, that would be really helpful. Um, and then um, there'll be a fourth question, will be an open-ended question and same thing, 60 seconds each candidate and there'll be a timer. So the first question is, Will you support a fully funded wage enforcement department that will use to that will use the city's power to end wage theft? Yes or no? Okay, I believe it's yes for everyone. 
question two. Would you support the expansion of the Boston living wage to cover more workers and an annual increase that reflects the rising cost of living? And we also have all yeses. Okay, question three. Do you support fair free transit? Yes or no? So we have three yeses. That's Carla, Rusi, Kelly, and the no's are Nick and Saeed. M Michael, did you have an answer? I've been yes from the get. Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry I missed you because the, all right. Um, so now the deep dive. So each candidate has um, 60 seconds. We'll start with Carla. And the question is, the city of Boston is slated to get 700 million from the federal government, including three to 400 million for BPS through the American Rescue Plan. What would you propose the use of these funds be? So we'll start with Carla and timer, please. All right, thank you. Um, you know, I think we need to invest more in our schools. I struggled a lot um, academically when I was going to school. My parents also had a language barrier at home. Um, and so I didn't have supports, you know, at home to, for, um, for school. And also our schools were very underfunded. And so as someone who was in my 20s did not know how to um, even turn on a computer because our schools were so poorly funded. Um, so I would like to invest more into universal um, pre-K um, and hiring more social workers in schools so that there are people that are more trauma-informed and can provide more social-emotional learning for our students at school. Just provide, you know, also, you know, universal free meals is something too that I would consider as well. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Next, we have Nick. Thank you. Uh, so I'd focus on two main areas. One, when it comes to BPS is infrastructure. Right, our schools, we're one of the oldest school districts in the country. And our schools, uh, that has been one of the number one struggles that we have focused on uh, when it comes to trying to reopen our schools. We need to make sure that our schools have adequate HVAC systems. We need to make sure that the, that the facilities meet the standards uh, and make sure that it's a warm and inviting place for our young people to wanna to go to school every day. Uh, but also I would use some of those funds to go directly to workforce development training opportunities that are linked to actual jobs. Uh, I've worked for companies like Uncle Barber, creating direct pipelines between uh, the Urban League and, and Mass Hire. So that way we're not just people, but we're making sure we're funding training that's linked to an actual high paying job at the end. And that I think will create a real trickle down that, that translates to housing and other key issues that our city is facing right now. Thank you, Nick. Next, we have Saeed. Thank you. As a former uh, Boston Public Schools uh, student and as a parent of um, PBS students, um, I would say one, school infrastructure, um, energy efficient schools, because obviously um, if you don't have energy efficient schools, you're, you're wasting a lot of money that would save schools operating costs. Secondly, I would say invest in our teachers, making sure that you know, they do have the, you know, um, the, the skills they need and they're well paid off. Um, third, I would say healthy food access for our students, because if our students are eating junk food, they're not going to be able to concentrate. And fourth, I would say STEM and vocational education. I'm very big on that because I come from the uh, technology background. If we equipped our students with the right skills and STEM and vocational skills, they can have the opportunity for high paying jobs, start a business, buy a house. And, and that's an opportunity for us to, uh, to bridge the wealth gap. Thank you, Saeed. So next we have Kelly. I would like to see better wages for our teachers. I would like to see us hire more teachers of color into our Boston public schools who need to represent our kids. I would like to see more support for our students with disabilities, for our language learners, for social workers. We should have a para, if not two, with a teacher in every classroom. They are taking on too much, trying to do hybrid learning, which will be the norm in the future. And we definitely need to have more energy efficient buildings and buses. 
worker training for jobs that are going to be relevant post pandemic folks we've got to be thinking about those kinds of jobs that are going to help people for example to bring back our businesses our local businesses our restaurants our arts our social economy um, our tourism as well as green jobs that actually can help people make a living thank you kelly and next we have michael Thank you, Karen. I'm going to have a front row seat as the chair of the Council's Committee uh, on COVID Relief Funds, and we'll be working closely with uh, BPS. Uh, clearly, physical uh, improvements to our schools, improving the HVAC and the temperature control in each of the classrooms. I would love to have uh, the best um, vocational school in the state as opposed to it being out in Worcester. So supporting Madison Park any way we can to prepare um, that uh, generation to the jobs that are coming online. Uh, intensive tutoring to prepare students for success. We're in a global economy. We get the best colleges, universities in the world, and uh, we need to make sure that our kids get into those schools. More school nurses, more social and emotional um, uh, opportunities to address, uh, particularly coming out of the pandemic, uh, the mental health needs uh, and trauma, uh, programs and partnerships that will help close the achievement and the opportunity gap like Boston GF13, um, and uh, year-round youth jobs, not just summer jobs, but year-round youth jobs at that uh, take their lead from labor demands. Thank you, Michael. Last but not least, we have Rusi. So I think you, we need on the education front, we need capital investments. We need capital investments in our buildings and we need transparency around that. We see the, that ja the Jackson man in Alston is closing after parents in that community. We're asking questions for years and years from central office as to what was happening to their school. Um, we need capital investments in our schools and we need inv capital investments in human capital to bolster central office so that parents have confidence in what's happening in BPS so that we are able to hire really great talent that can really push BPS forward. Um, every, you know, educational equity and excellence is achievable if we have great leadership. Um, and uh, we also need to make sure that our buses are an all electric fleet that will, you know, our biggest carbon footprint in the city is um, is our is our school buses. So making sure that we're transitioning to that will help. Um, there's a lot we need to do on the education front, but um, uh, for uh, the rest of the money, um, we need to invest in green jobs, the Building Pathways program, partnering more with Madison Park um, so that it is a symbol of a strong vocational school. Building Pathways for vocational jobs is a really important resource and universal pre-K. All right, thank you candidates. And um, I'm gonna now turn it over to Amarni who will facilitate the closing. Hey everyone, Armani White here from Right the City Vote. Um, this one will be a shorter round. We're gonna start with a lightning round and then we're gonna have 45 seconds for a, a deeper dive. Um, and so at least from Right to the City Vote's point of view, um, our right to the city includes the right to, uh, for every inhabitant to participate in decisions that shape our city, whether it's the budget, land development, jobs, schools, uh, and services and approaches to public safety. Uh, we believe the right to democracy uh, includes the right to information, transparency, et cetera. Um, and so this, these questions are gonna be about democracy. So I'm gonna start off uh, with Ruthie. Okay. Uh, and the first question that we're gonna ask here is do you support allowing non-citizens, so non-citizen uh, residents with legal status, the right to vote in municipal elections? This is a lightning round. Right, oh. this is the lightning round, folks. So I just answer, oh. Yep, so yes or no. Yeah. Okay, I see Saeed uh, and Michael Flaherty with a no, Ruth C, Kelly, Nick, and Carla with yeses. Thank you. Um, okay, there we go. So that was a lightning round. It was just a quick lightning, one strike. Um, next question we have here is a uh, deeper dive. And this is gonna be again, 45 seconds for each um, candidate starting with uh, Nick Vance. Um, so what changes would you prioritize uh, to the city charter given the momentum around this opportunity? Again, we'll start with Nick Vance. Uh, thank you. I mean, I, I think that we, we really need to make sure and ensure that everybody has the right to vote. Uh, I think that it's an it's a easy, quick answer. Uh, I think that uh, when you're talking about what we're seeing across the country uh, is this, this kind of depression of, and suppression of people's rights. Uh, and I think that 
Uh, we need to make things easier for people and not make things harder for individuals uh, that want to have the right to participate. And I also think that we need to be strategic and intentional about when people do come here, uh, making sure that uh, we, we advocate uh, for their rights and we push for those things. So uh, that, that, that is at my heart, that's at my core. And I believe that that's something that I would 100% uh, aim for with the charter. Thank you. Saeed, you're next, please. Thank you. Um, I would advocate for two things. One would be for the city council to have a most say uh, in the city budget. Uh, and secondly, I would say uh, when it comes to the uh, school committee, um, you know, if we can have a hybrid model where some are appointed and elected, um, I'm up for those two recommendations. Awesome. Thank you, Saeed. Um, next, we have Kelly Bates. I would work immediately to influence the mayor and the city council to ensure that we have line item budget authority. Voters need to know that they elect city councilors and we can represent their voice in making budgetary decisions. It shouldn't be an up or down vote. That's not democracy. I believe we need to re-precinct. It's been ages and see how our voters are being represented in the city. And we should make sure that we think forward. How about participatory budgeting? Let's put that in the charter. I'd love to put money directly in the hands of voters to decide where the money should go. They should have some of that decision-making power, not just us. And we need to come together and really make those decisions together. Thank you. Michael Flaherty, you're next. Thank you. Uh, I just wanna um, let folks know as chair of government operations, I uh, had a, held a hearing to discuss the legal status to vote in municipal elections. And we heard uh, critical testimony from um, Veronica Serrato, Executive Director of Project Citizenship, who uh, testified that allowing uh, immigrants to vote in municipal elections may have unintended consequences, explaining that any non-citizen who mistakenly registered to vote or votes in a federal or state election um, by accident seriously jeopardizes their opportunity. So we erred on the side of, of caution there. With respect to the charter, um, obviously we've got some charter votes coming up. Um, you know, uh, elected school committee would be one um, and also uh, line item uh, budgeting uh, approval for the city council. Uh, we came close last year. There were some issues with it at the 11th hour. Um, Chairwoman um, Edwards is going to resubmit, and I think the language would be appropriate and should pass. Thank you so much, uh, Michael Flaherty. Uh, Ruth C. Luigian, next, please. Thank you, Amrani. I care deeply about calling people into the democratic process. I don't believe in a top-down structure of governing or of leading. It really all change happens from the from, from the ground up, from people closest to the issues. And so those folks should also have uh, a voice in our democratic process. That means a participatory budget, but it means a meaningful one. The, um, the city of Cambridge um, I, allows voters to make a minimal, uh, have a minimal say on, on, the, on a budget line item, that's, it, and it ends up being inconsequential. We wanna make sure that we're bringing voters in in a meaningful way to um, participate in uh, what our budget looks like. Also, we need to work with our state delegation for automatic voter registration, same day registration, everything we can do to get more people voting, so. Thank you, Lucy. Um, next, uh, last but not least, Carla Montero. Thank you. So I believe in um, line item veto um, for the budgets for city council and also giving more people um, the ability to vote. You know, people who are non-citizens um, are still members of our community and they should still have a say in the municipal elections. Um, and I do believe that show, people who are 16 years old um, should also be able to vote. Um, and I also um, would propose to establish an inspector general office right here in Boston. You know, there's no there's not much oversight. Um, and the city needs more independent IG um, it, and it, it would bring more transparency to our city. Um, so thank you. Thanks folks. Uh, thanks for talking about democracy with us today. Um, we're gonna pass, I'm gonna pass it off to the rest of you all to close this out. So we're gonna start with um, um, someone that I'm gonna say in one second, you're each gonna have a minute to, uh, to speak, okay? Uh, to close this out. Um, so we're gonna start with Saeed give you a minute and then we're gonna go through and uh, Ed is gonna close us out from our team. So thank you all. Uh, thanks everyone that's tuned in. And Saeed, let's get started. Thank you everyone. Uh, when I first was really relocated to Boston from Africa, um, you know, I didn't realize I was poor because I had access to you know, clean parks, clean playgrounds, the auto arboretum, Jamaica Pond. 
you know, um, that's why the environment is one of my top three priorities because growing up in Africa, uh, my uh, playgrounds were like burning landfills. And uh, I know what it feels like to live in affordable housing because I lived in, um, you know, South Boston, Charlestown, Roslyn, the, all the public housings um, in that area. And uh, coming from the technology background, I am very big on STEM and vocational education uh, because, you, you know, that's one of the best ways to bridge the wealth gap if we equip um, our young kids with the right skills um, and technology, you know, vocational skills. Um, and my top three priorities, um, housing, um, the um, STEM vocational education and the environment. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I look forward to meeting all of you on the streets of Boston. Thank you, Mr. Saeed Abdekarim. Next, we have Kelly Bates. Thank you all. I think it's so important right now in this city. We are about to make history, I believe, as a city forward looking around issues like racial justice and progressive justice. I have worked 30 years with the groups that have sponsored this forum. I am proven, you know who I am. I've worked in community alongside you to build voter engagement in Boston for 10 years, to redistrict our seats, to remove gerrymandering of our people of color. I have worked to have nutrition, benefits, healthcare, worker justice for communities of color, low-income communities, people with disabilities in this city. I have been a champion for women and girls. When is the last time we've had someone since Congresswoman Presley when she was at large fighting those kinds of battles? I was a victim of teen dating violence. I will fight for women who right now in the pandemic are coming out of difficult times. I will make sure that I work with the mayor because I know most of the mayoral candidates to create justice in the city. I believe we have better days ahead and I will do that with you. Thank you so much, Kelly Bates. Um, Michael Flaherty, you're next. Thank you for the opportunity to address the, the progressive organizations and groups today. Um, the council, uh, in particular at large council is are, are accountable to diverse constituencies across Boston, uh, different communities that prioritize uh, different issues. So as a citywide elected official who continues to work for every constituency, uh, I, I make sure that there are seats at the table for all voices. And my record demonstrates that, uh, not only my voting record, but um, you know uh, the, uh, the organization and, and the relationships I've been able to build across the city. Uh, we're at a critical juncture in our city, clearly as we're coming out of, of the pandemic, we'll also be ushering in a new mayoral administration. We'll have at least five new members of the council joining, you know, three members that are in their first term. If there's every year for experience in leadership and mentorship, it's this year, and I provide that uh, as uh, you know, steady hand at the Boston City Council. And uh, my record speaks for itself in terms of the votes that I've taken, uh, and uh, look forward to working together collaboratively. We were honored to have your vote uh, in the preliminary, and then again in the final election to go back to work as one of your four at-large councilors. Thank you, and good night, everybody. Thank you, Michael Flaherty. Um, next, we have Ruth Z. Luigian. Thank you. There is nothing more sobering than standing in housing court trying to protect someone's right to stay in their home. If you go to housing court, it is a depressing place because it a, is it a, it's a place that condemns people who are poor. We are talking about women. We are talking about women of color. We're talking about women of color with children. So we are at a place in our city coming out of this pandemic where we know the issues of equity. We know that they affect communities of color, women with children more, more than anyone else. And if we are going to stand here and stand up and say that we are for them, that we are fighting for working class families, for folks who have been shut out of this city for too long, I have had that experience of working alongside long hours, late hours to make sure people can stay in their homes. So please join me. I would love to earn one of your four, vote, four votes. Rootsy for Boston.com. I'm a daughter of working class immigrants. I know what it takes to work hard and get results for everyone, whether you're in Eastie, Rosie, everywhere in the city, uh, Mattapan, Roxbury, Southie, I'm running to represent everyone. Ruthsy for Boston.com. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ruthsy Luigian. Um, next, we have Carla Montero. Thank you again um, to all of you who organized the event tonight. And thank you to all of you who are at home watching. Um, this campaign has me really fired up um, in, this in this competitive field. Um, you know, I bring a unique lived experience and my own professional experience as a social worker. I know the issues that face Boston of residents every day because I have experienced the pain of in housing insecurity, trauma from gun violence and environmental racism and the stigmatization of mental illness. I've overcome all of those challenges. And like our, our Congresswoman Ayanna Presley says, those people that are closest to the pain should be closest to the power, driving and informing the policymaking. And that's what my campaign is 
it's all about. I sincerely believe and we can achieve a Boston where everyone's basic needs are met. We have to be bold enough to imagine it and passionate enough to fight for it. I'm committed to listening to you and collectively identifying needs and connecting you to services. Thank you. You can follow me at CarlaForBoston.com and also um, check out our social media pages at Carla for Boston. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carla Montero. Um, and last but not least, we have Nick Vance. Thank you so much. And it is truly an honor and a pleasure to be able to be here today with you all to speak. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm born and raised from this city and uh, I'm passionate and, and extremely concerned about the future of our city. And I say that to say that I've, I've always been raised to practice what I preach. I've been focused on this pandemic since the beginning. Uh, I've worked with Age Strong in the city of Boston and got over 5,000 elders of color vaccinated in this city back in February and January, right? I wanna make sure that I don't just say things, but I wanna make sure that I actually am intentional about trying to get them done. Uh, I have focused on issues in and around policing and we made sure that body cams were implemented. I've been in and around the mayor's millennial council dealing with how do we keep millennials in this city? And I've been a part of making sure that millennials can get more livable wages and jobs for the future. Uh, I am committed to making this city a better place for all of us. And I hope it, for your support and guidance. Thank you. Thank you, Nick Vance. Okay, thank you all for your closing statements. Uh, we have Ed here to close us out. Okay, uh, I think for, for the voters, I think you, you got to hear from six really good candidates and we hope that you learn more about them, got to a feel for their style and their positions. And remember, you're gonna choose four uh, to be at large city councilors. And I also encourage you to stick around and and listen to the candidates, the six candidates we have in our second hour. I think everyone's information who's appeared in the first hour is available. So if you want to learn more, you can go to their websites or you can see them on Zoom or hopefully see them in person soon. Um, of course, we want to thank the candidates uh, as well for being here. Uh, and I think everyone headed out. So for the audience, we're going to start the second hour at, at eight, 10 past eight. And we're going to take a small break now for a few minutes so people can get something to eat or, or head to the bathroom if they need to. And we'll be back on at 10 past eight. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank oh, you. there you go. You're over there. Thank okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. It's good to see all of you. Have yeah. a good night. Bye. Bye. Good night. Hi, Ed. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You're good. Thanks. It's thank good to see you. you. I know. I'll let you go to the bathroom, too. Okay. <laughs> Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. I'm just going to interrupt to ask if Aaron Murphy is in the audience. Um, we, we're trying to find you. If you, if you have a different name, <clears throat> if you could rename yourself, that would be great. Ziba, if you can see in the chat, she's apparently Margaret Whalen and she's unable to start video. Good evening, everyone. Hey, Dominguez, how you doing? I'm good, thanks for having me. It's good to see you. I'm at the restaurant. Aaron, can you share your, your video so we can um, pin you? Thank you. Yes, thank you. It wasn't allowing me to share the video until I guess you verified me. So now I have to change, sorry. Where am I? Oh, 
We should Dave be Howler, Can you um, share your video so we can pin you? Perfect. Evening, everybody. Hey, Dave. Okay, one minute to show time. Nice to see all these beautiful people. We have 185 people with us so far tonight. We, we had, and we are also live streaming on Facebook. So there's quite a bit out there. Julia, I saw your shush face, but she does very cute, you know. <laughs> it's going to be hard because I can't mute here. So I'm like, you know, you're going to have to behave. Give her that teacher look, the mom look. Mm -hmm. Hey, good evening. Welcome to our round two candidates and our audience members that are just joining now. My name is Annie Russo. On behalf of all the co-sponsors, we welcome you to tonight's second half of a very important forum. We hope that hearing from the candidates tonight will help you decide which four candidates you will cast your vote for on September 14th. The candidates that receive the most votes will be on the ballot on November 2nd. Spanish and Cantonese interpreting is available. To turn it on, click on the world icon at the bottom of the screen and select your preferred language. If you are in an app or on a phone or tablet, click on the three dots and select language in the menu. If you are on a web browser or a Chromebook, you cannot listen to the interpretation. We will also be using closed caption. We want to again thank the interpreters, Wei Quinte and Yusin Mock, Jasara Burgos and Nicholas Magnolia. This forum is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. We ask the audience to be respectful when posting in chat. Please do not engage in harassing, discriminatory, intimidating behavior that stifles debate and constructive dialogue. We also ask that the campaigns do not post. And now Ed will begin the second half of the forum. Okay, uh, good to see you all. Uh, we're going to take you through a, a four-part uh, program here. Uh, we're going to have a one-minute opening statement, uh, a one-minute closing statement, and then in five sections, we'll start with lightning round questions, which are yes or no at the start, and then within that same subject, we'll have an open-ended question. Like if it's on housing, you'll have either two or three lightning questions that you're going to select either yes or no. Uh, without verbalizing, you're just going to press yes or no. And then after those are over, you'll also have a chance to answer one open-ended question on housing that'll give you more freedom to express your views and define your views. So, you know, that's how that piece is going to work. And we put the, light, the yes or no question at the front of the subject, like again, say education, because we found that that was revealing to voters about where people really stood and then it's at the same time, it gave the candidates freedom to expound on their views in one of the open-ended questions. So that's why we have it structured that way. Uh, and I think you know that's the essentials you need to know. And I'm going to hand it off to uh, Melissa Beltran, who's one of the co-moderators and the youth moderator, and she'll explain to you exactly how the, the timing piece works. Uh, so Melissa, take it away. Yes, so for the opening, that's gonna go for one minute and we're gonna go, we're gonna have a lightning round, which candidates are gonna use um, their reaction button to uh, respond either yes or no. That's gonna follow up with key topics in depth um, for 45 to 60 seconds. Um, and then we're gonna have closing st statements for each candidate for 45 seconds. And we are gonna go um, in alphabetical order and rotate um, as we go. And towards the end, we are gonna have a 10 second warning and five seconds 
seconds until, um, you know, we mute the candidate. So you'll have an extra 10 seconds after your time is up. And now we, I'm gonna hand it over to Jonathan to get us started. Uh, Melissa, just take them, invite them to give an opening statement as well. I'm sorry, Ed, what was that? Just to invite them to give an opening statement as well. Oh, yes, absolutely. And so for the opening statement, we have um, James Collin can go first. Good evening. First and foremost, I'd like to thank all the organizers for this wonderful forum. My name is James Reginald Coleman. I came from the beautiful island of Haiti 25 years ago in search of a better life for my family and I. I'm running for city council because I strongly believe my platform will resonate with everyone. When it comes to education, our kids cannot read properly. They can balance a checkbook. Financial literacy should be part of our curriculum. The digital divide. We have free Wi-Fi internet access in downtown Boston when they can afford it, yet not in JP and other communities. I want to start a program for minorities to go to law school so we can expose them to the law with um, high paying internships. I work for four mayors in two different municipalities. I speak French, Spanish, Haitian Creole, and obviously English. I'm dedicated, compassionate, and I am for Boston, for a better Boston for all of us. Thank you for having me. And next we have Domingo De Rosa. Hello all, um, I'd like to say thank you for having me tonight. Thank the candidates for taking the time out there, busy day uh, to join the rest of us, the audience for tuning in, uh, the interpreters, that's a nice touch today. Um, makes the rest of the city feel inclusive. Uh, uh, the outlaws uh, at the beginning of the forum. So I'm Domingos De Rosa. This is my third time running for city council. This is the third time I stand in front of this body asking for an opportunity to represent the city of Boston as a whole, to show Boston a difference in the way that we can approach the same ideas with different ways. We all want to talk about education, housing, economic opportunities, public safety, police reform. I have suffered tremendously in these options that we're speaking about. And the way that we can attack these is collectively by including all voices and the voices of the community that I represent. Thank you. Next, we have Alex Gray. Good evening. My name is Alex Gray. I live here in Jamaica Plain with my wife, Lauren. And listen, I was not born a good listener, uh, but I had to become one when I went blind. And you have to be a good listener when you're blind if you want to succeed in life and at school and at work. And I have taken that ability to listen throughout my career in public service. I started working, advocating for permanent housing for homeless individuals, and I listened. I then worked for Governor Deval Patrick, advising him on transportation and public safety at a time he launched the Fairmount commuter rail line, and I listened. And I've spent the past seven years working for Mayor Walsh at a time where we helped him launch the tuition-free community college plan, and we listened. And I will take that ability to listen to ensure that your story is heard at Boston City Council and to ensure that the stories of people with disabilities are heard at the Boston City Council. So I thank you for your time and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Alex. Aaron Murphy. Oh, hi, thank you. So thank you for inviting me tonight. I'm Erin Murphy. And if you're raising your family in the city, I am your counselor. If you have a child and you're trying to navigate the school system and advocate for your child's academic, not just academic, but social success, I am definitely your counselor. If you or a loved one is struggling with mental health and addiction, I am your counselor. And if you have a senior in your life that you want to help get services, and help battle the isolation that we know has been so hard, especially this past year through the pandemic. I'm your counselor. And if you want the city to work for you, then I am your counselor. I am a mother, I'm a teacher, I'm a community advocate and leader, and I care about helping others 
in working hard to get things done. My top three priorities are academic success for all students, focusing on the foundational um, lower grades, safe neighborhoods, and a healthy Boston addressing mental health recovery services, homeless and poverty. So I think my time's up. I wanted to remind you guys, you do have 10 seconds after the timer. Oh, so okay. after the 10 seconds are up is okay. when you will be cut off. So just um, so you guys I thought know. I was getting cut off. So I stopped. But thank you. As a hard, the hardest working candidate, I do ask for your support. One of your four votes in September. Thank you. And I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Julia Mejia. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here uh, tonight with you all. I'm really excited and I'm happy to see translation, interpretation, and that it's being recorded on Facebook so that all people have access to this. So thank you for being so intentional about this um, forum. So for many of you who know, I ran in 2019 because I'm an Afro-Latina. I'm an immigrant, a single mom, and a community activist. And I believe that all voices need to be at the table informing the dialogue. And that is what we have done in our office since um, we had the opportunity to earn your trust by one vote. Um, since being in office, we've continued to engage people in ways that we haven't seen here in the city before. We focus a lot of our energy on the way we approach our constituents is through four different ways, policy, programming, protocols, and procedures. We believe that everyone needs to be at the table and what we've been doing in this um, particular space is not only creating a seat at the table, but being informed and led by those who are living the realities so we can push the work forward. And I'm looking for a second term so I can do unfinished business. So thank you so much for having me here tonight. Thank you, last but not least, David Halbert. Good evening, everyone. My name is David Halbert, and I'm running to be one of your four city councilors at large. And the reason that I'm running is because Boston is an incredible city full of opportunities, but we know that those opportunities aren't shared equally by everyone. As a black man living in the city, I know what it is to be looked around, looked past, looked through, and sometimes looked at suspicion, even by the government that's supposed to serve you. But I know that if we work together, if we bring a progressive, innovative vision towards what city government can be, we can take our values and turn them into real practical policies on the ground, to come to policies that affirm that housing should be a human right, that we need to make sure that everyone has a hand in the economic vitality of our city, particularly our small businesses, and making sure that we have true education equity for students just like my daughter, other BPS kids, and everyone across the city. If we do that, I know we can transform the city. And that comes from a career of over 15 years in public service, including right here on the city council. If we work together, if we commit to these kind of values, we can build Boston, not just the kind of Boston that we want to have, but the kind of Boston that we deserve to have. I'm looking forward to having this conversation about that Boston tonight. Thank you so much. That wraps up our introductions. Now we are gonna get into our round one with questions. I'm gonna hand it over to Jonathan. Hey everybody, thank you for being here. Um, we're gonna start our night with the very important topic for our city education. Um, and just as a quick recap, uh, we will have a lightning round followed by an uh, in-depth question. The way the lightning round will work, uh, uh, just re repeating here for folks, is <clears throat> folks will use the reaction button. Uh, there's a, a, a kind of check mark for yes or the red uh, X for no. Um, and I will uh, acknowledge folks' uh, uh, votes um, and, and read it out, out loud. Folks will also get the screenshot later. Um, and we shall go from there. And if folks need to feel free to uh, 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 vocalize your answer as well. So uh, the uh, first lightning question is, do you support making permanent the interim plan for exam school admissions implemented during COVID? All right, I'm just waiting for one more candidate. I believe it was yes from David Halbert, Domingos de Rosa, Julia Mejia. Um, it was no from Aaron Murphy, um, Alex Gray. James, do you have an answer? Yes, I'm trying to do it. I can't, for some reason, I can't find it. One second. If candidates could put your answers again, please. Thank you. It's where it says reactions, James. That's right. James, are you a yes Thank or you a 
All right. So yeses, uh, Dave, Domingos, Julia, James, no, Aaron, Alex. Thank you. Um, the next question. Do you support a change to the school committee that would give the youth representative both a vote and a stipend? All right, that's yes, Dave, Domingos, Julia, James, Coleman, um, and Alex Gray. No, Aaron Murphy. And that's David Halbert, of course. Um, and then, um, and then we have our deep uh, dive qu uh, question here. So uh, our deep dive question is: Boston is the only municipality in the state that does not have an elected school committee. Do you support a fully elected school committee? What system would you support? Um, and for this, candidates will have 60 seconds. Uh, we will start a rotating alphabetical order. So this round, we will start with Domingos and then go to Alex, and then I will call on folks from there. So Domingos, feel free. Um, I'm for a elected school committee um, to put the powers back into the city of Boston, the residents, the individuals who are actually impacted by the operation of BPS. We need to allow individuals in the city, different organizations, um, students, along with um, the, the um, <clears throat> excuse me, city council to be able to pick individuals that will continue to advocate for the line items on the budget that we'll be looking for to make sure that students um, receive the proper support around their issues the traumas that they face to and from school every day. Um, we also wanna make sure that we include the parents. This is why it's important to have uh, BCYF be integrated with BPS in some way, some form of making sure that all the services are covered from um, our youngest to our oldest. Um, these departments we have, the policy, the procedures already are in play. We just need to make sure that we roll them out collectively together with the input from the folks who use this. Thank you, Domingos. Uh, next, we have Alex Gray. I support a hybrid model uh, where the mayor would appoint some seats, and then I'm open to whether the second part would be elected or uh, appointed by, say, the city council and others. My top priority with the school committee, and I proposed this and it was printed in the Boston Herald last week, is for a dedicated seat to represent the interests of special education students. 21% of Boston public school students are in the special education system and they are so often left out of the larger conversations. We had a 10 hour debate in September about entrance to the top three schools in our system when we have parents that couldn't dream of the city spending 10 minutes discussing the bare minimum necessities uh, that so many of these students need. So that, that will be my top priority in education. I'm open to expanding uh, neighborhood in terms of exam school entrances, I just don't think we can go to 80% neighborhood uh, right off the bat. I would like a more gradual approach. Thank you, Alex. Next, we have David Halbert and then Julia Mejia. Go ahead, David. Yes, I'm in favor of a hybrid school committee model as well. Look, I'm a Boston Public Schools parent. Uh, my daughter sits right behind me on Zoom in kindergarten, has for the last year. I think we absolutely have to make sure that parents and families all across our city have a voice at the table. But we have to also preserve accountability. Boston Public Schools is the single largest portion of the city budget. So whether you have a child in the school system or not, it still affects you. It affects that money that can go towards so many other things that we know we need to have happen here in the city of Boston. So it's important that the mayor and our city councilors, as the individuals that we elect to lead this city, have direct accountability for the outcomes. For yes, the successes, and that's wonderful, but also for those areas where we might be failing our kids. We can't let them have themselves be held out at arm's length from those decisions. Using the school committee as an elected school committee as a scapegoat for decisions that need to be happening and that need to have the mantle of leadership that we thrust on them brought to the table. So I believe that we need to have a hybrid school committee model with elected positions for the communities, with appointed positions for the mayor and the city council, and ensuring that we have a full voting student member as well. Thank you. Um, Julian here. 
Um, so I support a fully elected school board, period. Um, I, I think that, you know, having grown up in the city of Boston um, as a student and, and now as a Boston public school parent, I understand how important it is to really um, offer a, a real seat at the table. And I think that through the democracy, democratic process, um, I think that we'll be able to hold folks who sit in that space more accountable. I also believe that we should have a, a full um, a student who is uh, paid to also be on the um, board and that that um, young person also has a voting right. Um, I, I think that it's due time. It's a shame that the city of Boston is the only municipality in the entire um, state that it doesn't have a, an ability to uh, dictate our own fate. And I, and I think that this is probably one of the reasons why we've had so many issues here in the city of Boston, specifically around family and community engagement, because the voices of the people are not really being amplified. So I'm in a full support for a fully elected um, school committee. Thank you. Next, we have Erin Murphy. Hi, so thank you. So as a school teacher for over 20 years, Boston Public School teacher and currently a special ed director. And also I was on Mayor Walsh's educational transition team where I advocated that there was more of a voice for our special education families who I advocate for day in and day out and have for decades, absolutely approve or are in favor of a fully elected school committee, I think for accountability and also so that all of the voices in the neighborhoods in the city can, in the school will have to be more transparent so we can have the issues like Alex mentioned that we are talking not just about exam schools, but we're talking about vocational schools and special education needs. So I am in favor of a fully elected school committee. And for a student absolutely feel that there should be a stipend and that their voices should be heard and maybe also have more than one student on the school committee to hear their voices as they're in the schools. Thank you, Erin. Um, and last, uh, we have Kate here. I, I fully support a hybrid model, simply because of the fact that if you do not have a hybrid model, you will not have the diversity you are seeking. I wanna make sure that a, the committee has students that are paid um, for their services. I wanna make sure that members of the Disability Commission are part of that um, committee. I wanna make sure that members of LGBTQ plus are part of that committee. By having an elected body, you will not have that. By having a hybrid model, I hope that whomever is mayor, he or she will make sure that we have the diversity we are seeking. As a father of two kids, my daughter goes to Boston Latin School and my son is at Holy Name Parish School. I wanna make sure that Boston has the best to offer to all of them. Thank you. Thank you so much, candidates. Um, so that concludes our education section. And next we are, are on to housing, same format. Um, my colleague, Melissa, will take that on. Thank you, Melissa. Great, thank you, Jonathan. So yes, so same yes or no, we would have um, each candidate is gonna have 30 seconds to answer. The subject we are on is housing. So first question, do you support rent control? Yes or no? We have a yes for David Halbert, Julia Mejia, Domingo De Rosa, um, and a yes from Alex Gray, leaving with two no's from Aaron Murphy and James um, Collimon. Next question. Do you support the renewal of Boston's condo con conversion law, which affords residents of covered properties a notice period, right of the first refusal to purchase their unit, relocation assistance, just cause eviction and relocation benefits if their unit is converted to a condominium? And we have a yes from Domingo De Rosa, J James Colomon, Alex Gray, Aaron Murphy, David Halber, and Julia Mejia. So all candidates responded yes. Next question. Would you support a tenant opportunity to purchase ordinance enabling tenants with, wish to remain to purchase a building if the owner seeks to put it on the market? And we have a yes from Julia Mejia, Domingo De Rosa, Aaron Murphy, 
Alex Gray, David Halbert, and James Colomon. So all candidates responded yes. I'm so sorry for jumping in. Could all candidates put that on one more time so I could get the screenshot with everyone's response? Thank you very much. Got it. Thank you very much. No problem. Next question. Do you support requiring that a majority of new affordable units be built on site in order to ensure communities are diverse and integrated? And we have a yes from David Halbert, Julia Mejia, Domingo De Rosa, Aaron Murphy, James Colomon, and Alex Gray. So again, all candidates responded yes. And now we're going to a deep dive question where each candidate has 60 seconds to answer. Um, I'm going to start with Alex Gray. The question is, if you had to prioritize one policy to address our affordable housing crisis, what would it be? Yeah, so I'll, I will talk about affordability. I think the first generation home buyer program launched by Mayor Walsh recently is a great way to allow families to, to grow wealth and start the trajectory of financial security for their family. But we have had city council candidates uh, for years talk about affordable housing and that's so important and we need people I am going to be a city council candidate who will also talk about accessible housing. In America, 1% of housing is physically accessible to people with wheelchairs. And if you think it's hard to find a place that's affordable, think about how hard it is if you're a senior or if you're a person with a disability to find a place that is both affordable and accessible. So I will fight for affordability, but I will fight more for accessibility Lastly, on rent control, I support the state uh, legislation for a local option. I think we need to have a longer conversation about specifics for rent control in Boston. Thank you. And just to clarify on the last lightning question, um, um, Aaron, was that a yes or a no? To the, do you support requiring that a majority of new affordable, affordable units be built on site in order to ensure communities are diverse and integrated? Okay, I just wanted to make sure we had your response. Um, thank you, Alex. And next, Dave Albert. Yes, so there's one area that I think we should prioritize in terms of housing affordability. It's making sure that we have more housing. It's critically important. That's why I'm in support of what I call smart density, making sure that we're adding more buildings to the unit, excuse me, to the city, uh, but doing so not in just a, a way where we're haphazardly throwing them out with no kind of central planning, making sure that we're siting large buildings so that we can have more units. And once again, not just single occupancy units, but ensuring that we have family sized units so families can stay and can grow here in the city of Boston and siting those next to major thoroughfares, next to major public transit access points so that we're ideally limiting the number of folks who are coming to communities and also bringing cars and needing and necessitating cars uh, in our community because we know that has such a detrimental impact on our overall quality of life and particularly our environment and our health. So I think if we have real intentional planning, uh, the kind that would call for the BPDA to be broken up into two separate agencies, quite frankly, we can make the kind of decisions and the design for our city where we're going to be able to have more units, more affordability, more accessibility. Great. And Julia Mejia, you're up next. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm just going to give you a few, but just one. I think that, you know, uh, I'm for a 50% IDP raising it up. Um, I, I know that's crazy, but I think we need to reflect what the city needs. I also believe that we need to lower the threshold when IDP kicks in. And for one of the things that we've been doing in our office is really focusing on civic engagement and the voices of the people in the planning and development process. Oftentimes, we hear from folks that things are being done to them without them. So we're in the process right now of creating a citywide steering committee to help inform our planning and development process so that we can create real meaningful pathways to civic engagement. And one thing else that I'd like to add as far as some of the work that we've done in our office is through our language access and information justice efforts we have been fighting on the council to ensure that we're not only just offering translation and interpretation, but that we're really super mindful of the fact that um, community voices need to be deeply rooted and centered in all decision making processes. Thank you. Erin Murphy. Uh, yes. So as a renter myself, I know firsthand how increasingly expensive and unaffordable the city is. 
and fifth generation here in the Boston and my young adult children. It makes me sad that they may be, may be the first in our family to not be able to afford to stay here. So it's definitely an issue that we have to address. I do think we have to look at the resources the city already has and work on that. I'm in favor of 100% affordable units on a lot of the city owned lots across the city. Repurposing abandoned or underdeveloped buildings is another issue. Another thing I am in favor of, in favor of the linkage program. But I think it's also a conversation about our school system, our workforce development and job training to make sure that our children are growing up in a city that we're giving them the tools to get jobs and be trained so that they can have high quality paying, good paying jobs to be able to afford. As a single mom and a union member in the Boston Public Schools, I was able to afford to stay here, even though rent is increasingly, you know, Thank you, Aaron. James Coleman. Thank you, Melissa. I strongly believe that we should use affordable um, housing in a smarter way. When we think about affordable housing, we want to make sure that city-owned land that are throughout the city are repurposed for that fact. As a renter as well myself, I know how hard it is to stay in the city, especially in a city where there's a residency requirement for people working for the city. I wanna make sure that we have to rethink so many other things. Um, when you have housing in low-income neighborhoods, you further segregation. We need to stop that. We wanna make sure that with $4 trillion on the market, on, on, you know, right now from the federal government, government coming down, we need to make sure that we think all the ways to really find the best way to, for commuters so they have better ways. They can say in neighborhood cities, they don't have to come and take the stock for the housing. And students, perhaps developers should think about students housing. They take a big bulk of the housing market that we have right now. Perhaps developers should start thinking of building for search just students. Great. And Domingo De Rosa, you're up next. Yeah, there's a few things we can address. Uh, I'll start off with the IDP. Um, that's something within the city council's control policies that we can work on and make changes. I will also advocate at the state and federal level, as you know, the AMI is a federal um, regulation and it will take, you know, collective effort um, between local, state and federal um, representatives to make sure that we advocate at that level, increase the visibility um, of how we go about doing it and including others. I also like to talk about, you know, the city lots that we have. The city stopped building public, public housing uh, and we need to get back to that. We need to be building housing that the city controls where we can accommodate individuals who are making $33,000 a year. That's the average income for folks in Roxbury and Dorchester versus 170 on the waterfront. So, you know, for us to really um, address a lot of these issues, there's other components that come into it. And, you know, our education and economic opportunities also line into it. But to stick to the policies that we're talking about, we can start off by working on the IDP and making sure that a lot of these developers stay within the guidelines as they um, do. And we can increase them by increments depending on the size of the project, like the dot block that mm -hmm. went from 300 something. And we can. Um, thank you, Domingo. And now we are moving to round three. Um, we are going to be talking about police and I'm going to pass it over to Ed. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Uh, so we're gonna have three yes or no questions followed by one open-ended question that you'll have a minute to answer. The first yes or no question is, do you support closing the Boston Police gang database? Okay, the yeses are Julia Mejia. Domingo De Rosa, Alex Gray, James Coleman. Uh, I can't tell. Uh, David is yeah. David Halbert is yes, and the, the no is Aaron Murphy. And I'm I'm so sorry, Ken. It's again. Can we get all of those up on the same time? Some of yours disappear. Some of them stay on the whole time. It depends on what yeah. you're using the platform is. Thank you very much, um, Julia you. and Alex. If we could get yours, thank you very much. Okay. Are we all set, Rebecca? Yep, got him. Okay. Uh, so the second yes or no question is, do you support ending information sharing between BPD and ICE? The yes, yes is Alex, in the yeses is Alex Gray, 
James Coleman, uh, keep your votes up so I can see them. Uh, I see Domingos de Rosa, Julia Mejia, David Halbert, and Aaron Murphy. So all yeses, six yeses. And the third yes or no question is, would you advocate for the reallocation of money from the Boston Police Department budget into reinvestment in communities? And the yeses are David Halbert, Julia Mejia, Domingos de Rosa, James Coleman, and the two no's are Alex Gray and Evan Murphy. And Rebecca, are you all set? Have, you, are this, have they been up on the screen long enough? Yes, sir, we got them all, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, now we're out of the yes, no. Now you get to expound on your views a little bit. And, and the question is, what would your approach to public safety, policing and spending be as an at-large city councilor, given that you only have partial control or very limited control over both the budget and the police contract? So given that, you know, what your role is, what would your approach be? And uh, we'll get to start off with David Halbert. Yes, thank you. This is an important and deeply personal issue. You know, as a black man living in the city, uh, issues around public safety and are part of the conversation that we're having, not just locally, but that we're having all across the country. As a city councilor, I would advocate for a few things. The first is making very hard decisions as to what we would vote yes or no within the budget relative to public safety and where that money is going, uh, where it shouldn't be going, quite frankly. We need to have our answer to every uh, problem that's coming up in our society not be an officer armed with a gun. We need to make sure that we're investing in things like mental health health services, like substance use counselors, like social workers and other clinicians, and making sure that we're addressing them as equally and equitably as possible. But also this speaks to the larger conversation of why we need to have a change in our budget and authority process within the city hall and within the city council so that city councilors can have more of a direct influence on this. I think this speaks to all this and the fact that we need to get things under control, like our rampant overtime spending that we've seen is really crippling and taking away from, once again, the resources that need to go towards so many other things. And so that's why I'm in favor of changes such as reducing the amount of guaranteed overtime hours uh, as part of the negotiations that the city has during the collective bargaining process. And it would be informing the mayor and others about that. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, Julia Hi, Mejia. Um, sorry, can we pause just one sec? We've got a timer issue. Um, you could just give us- Okay, it's good. You have, you have more time to think. You got, you got a few <laughs> minutes to relax. But when we do start, we're gonna start the question with Julia Mejia when, when we do get the okay, all right? So that means we got cheated out of time or we have no 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 we're just freezing everything you're gonna oh. get all your time i think we'll have to do it manually um so i'm gonna just put it on my my phone and i'm i'm gonna give you a 10 second warning i apologize until we figure this out okay so this is one minute um go, uh, go ahead and julia so the question is given your constraints as a counselor around budgeting and the police contract, what would your approach be to the issues? Yeah, I, I'm happy to say that I think our office has been one of the leading voices on, on all things that deal with police reform. Um, we actually, during the budget season, were fighting for a 15% reallocation while most of the advocates were pushing for 10. Again, I think that the harder we go, the, the more likely we are to get to that middle ground. Um, and so just so you all know, in terms of some of the work that we've done, we filed the Civilian Review Board alongside Councilor Arroyo and Campbell, and our office fought to have a youth on that board and that position to get paid. We also supported the ban on chemical weapons. We filed an ordinance on non-police alternatives to 911, and we're now currently filing the trust act alongside with other advocates. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Aaron Murphy will be next. Make sure you unmute. Not sure how that happened, sorry. So I've lived here in the city my whole life, raising my children here in campaign, being a school teacher, I know, because I know families all across the city, 
door knocking on thousands of doors already this time around this campaign and talking to neighbors all across the city, no matter what neighborhood they live in. Public safety is the number one issue. It comes up every time. It often comes up before we talk about schools and education. And so I do believe that we need to expand our cadet program and our, as a city councilor, I will work on the staffing issue, this forced overtime. Many of the police officers don't even want the forced overtime. When we hire only 30 new police officers, we have 11 districts across the city. That's only one more police officer per shift. We're not addressing the fact that we need more police officers. We also, I would support also the community and youth leadership funding and other, um, but we need to support our police department with the staffing also, I believe. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Uh, same question for James Coleman. Coleman? Thanks, Ed. I strongly believe that everyone should feel safe wherever they call home in Boston. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, we need the police, but the police took an oath. They take an oath to protect and serve. As a black man living in the city, I can tell you that I've suffered my share of racial profiling, despite the fact that I have many friends that are cops that I respect. Most of them are good, but at the same time, I need to make sure that we have uh, a police department that reflects the communities they are serving. I feel that we need to have more conversation about community policing. We need to hire more police officers. So we have to make sure that we have better conversation and making sure that Again, that uh, I should feel safe wherever I am. I remember taking my son to a Black Lives Matter um, rally. And when the NPR interviewed him, he's 10 years old. And they asked him, why are you here? And he said, well, I'm afraid I may be next. We should not have that in the city of Boston. We are better than that. And I'm counting on Boston. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, same question for Domingo Rosa. Make sure you unmute, Domingos. Hi, right, guys. Back again. I know this uh, conversation is very touchy for a lot of folks. Police are required um, to keep order in the city of Boston. As you can see, we have multiple issues across our city um, dealing with public safety. 19% of the budget uh, covers that. So what I, what I want to come from is the eye, you know from the eye of the actual individual who, who's the employee of the city, uh, the police officer. A lot of them are suffering from mental illness themselves, from being stressed out or being on the job 16 plus hours, uh, and on top of being dads and moms and so forth. So our, our first responders are tapped. They're like exhausted. Um, they're trying to keep order the best they can with what they have. They've asked uh, for more training um, from the ones that I've spoken to. They're asking for the, for the actual academy to give them more than um, the short amount of time they spend there. What we need to do as far as the budgets reallocate funds, um, where it falls on line items, where it goes into um, violence prevention, uh, community policing, and so <laughs> forth, and make sure that those programs are actually being um, accountable for the programs they serve. Okay, thank you, Domingos. Uh, same question for you, Alex. So I jumped into this race in September and I've had thousands of conversations with people about their feelings about policing in Boston. And a couple of concerns always come up. First is accountability. People by and large very much want greater accountability. They're afraid what happened to George Floyd could happen in their neighborhood. They're frustrated with some of the behavior of police officers uh, when they're not on the job as we've seen recently in the headlines. So they want a strong Office of Police Accountability, which is up and running. The City Council can fund that. They want subpoena power uh, for people to be called out for what they've done wrong. But I also talked to a lot of folks in neighborhoods where crime occurs, and they're afraid of the idea of moving money away from policing. So I'm a big proponent of change. I believe in mental health clinicians taking the lead, social workers taking the lead when possible. We can talk about traffic stops and who should be leading that, but I just think sometimes when we talk about funding or defunding, we turn the conversation in a way where people who are open to change get scared. So I, I want to talk about the specifics. As much as okay. Okay, that was Alex Gray. Uh, thank you, Alex. 
Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to one of the co-moderators, Karen Chen, who's going to get us going on the fourth section. Thank you, Ed. Um, so this section will be on workers and equitable economy. So the sponsor of this organization and members, we believe that good jobs make strong communities. To exercise our right to wealth and good jobs in the city, we must address long-term unemployment and underemployment, substandard work, and structural inequities of the economic system, ensuring access to job opportunities, improve job standards, support for community small businesses, and alternative economic enterprises. So I will ask three um, yes and no questions in the lightning round, um, following by a fourth question that's open-ended and each candidate will have 60 seconds. So the first question, will you support a fully funded wage enforcement department that will use the city's power to end wage theft? Yes or no? Can you hold on? Um, okay, if everyone, yes or no, and if you do it after, the unsharing, that would be helpful. So yes for everyone, I believe. Yes, yes for everyone. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I didn't get David's response recorded. Can we do that one more time? Thank you very much. Um, for Alex and Domingos, can you please? All good, thanks, Karen. Thank you. Okay, question two. Would you support the expansion of the Boston living wage to cover more workers and an annual increase that reflects the rising cost of living? So wait until we unshare the screen and then use your reaction button. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so we have yes. Um, Aaron's yours went away. Sorry, one more time. So yes for everyone? Great, all right, thank you. Question three, really short one. Do you support fare-free transit? So no for Aaron, and then yes for everyone. Okay, now we're gonna turn to um, the deep dive question. So um, the city of Boston is slated to get up to $700 million from the federal government. So around, um, that will include three to 4 million for BPS. And this is all through the American Rescue Plan. What would you propose use of these fund be? So we have uh, one minute each and we'll start with Julia. I'm on mute. Sorry. I'm on mute. Let's start the clock. A I didn't start it yet. Go ahead. Um, okay, so sorry. Uh, so I think that when we're, when we're thinking about the dollars that are going to be coming down, um, I think it's really important for us to be super mindful of who is at the table to inform the city on how to spend those dollars, because I think um, we have seen time and time again that um, decisions are being made without us. And that, a clear example of that was with the Boston Public Schools, they created a task force. And um, what we learned is that a lot of the folks that are in that space are the usual suspects. So I think that we need to ensure that we put a process in place of how we spend those dollars. And I'll just quickly say that um, some of the things that we're fighting for as it relates to the money that's coming down is to support our, our businesses that have been impacted by COVID as well as we filed and passed a, a residential <laughs> ordinance um, to support small at-home entrepreneurs. We believe that in the time of COVID, these are innovative ways to address these issues. And we're also currently right now working with the Boston Jobs Coalition on a living wage ordinance to um, update it. Hi. So Hi, okay, thank you. Thank you, Julia. So I think um, you can hear a little faint time. Um, that Ziba is gonna let you know. Um, so next we'll have Aaron. Aaron, you need a new. Thank you for this question. 
So I do um, believe that education is the ultimate equalizer as a school teacher my whole life. I've seen children come to us at all different levels with all different needs and we need to offer them the, the world-class education that they deserve. I think the one thing I would invest in first would be the social services and mental health. Many of our students come to us with trauma and need the mental health support. And we need to not just put a nurse in every school, but fully fund staff so they are able to address the needs that our students need. Also um, investing in equitable building improvements, as we know, the schools, when you go into them, don't look the same, and they should. All students should be going to schools that are, you know, they should be proud of the schools they're at. Also, um, the health and wellness, social services are important, but also investing in Madison Park and in knowing that, you know, the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce study a couple years ago stated how Boston will not be prepared. We're woefully unprepared for the skilled labor force we need. So we really need to invest, invest in Madison Park, making that a world-class high school that students want to um, attend. But did I run out of time? Sorry. Yes. yes. Sorry. Thank you, Erin. Thank you. Uh, so next we'll have James. Thank you, Karen. I strongly believe that education, education should be at the forefront in everything we're doing nowadays. We want to make sure that our youth are better prepared to meet the jobs of tomorrow. College is not for everyone. However, to kids that are graduating high school that do not want to go to college, we want to make sure there's a path for them. So needless to say, we need to re-energize our vocational training program. Madison Park should be among the best 25 schools in the nation. It's not right now. We want to make sure that entrepreneurship, a lot of kids are graduating high school, they, don't, they have the skills but they need more training, more coaching to start their own businesses. I wanna make sure that, again, that vocational training should not be only at Madison Park. Perhaps other schools should embrace some aspect of vocational training, whether you wanna become a cosmetologist, a, a plumber, or an electrician. I couldn't recall the last time a plumber came to my house, I didn't have to spend at least $150. And that doesn't mean the plan was fixed, right? That means there's a demand for it. However, we divide the trade here. We devalue the trade. We need to make sure that the plumber is as respected as a doctor, as an engineer, just like they do it in Germany and other places in the world. Thank you. Thank you, James. Next, we'll have Domingos. Oh, you have to unmute. Sorry, guys, I keep forgetting that. Um, as a BPS uh, graduate, class of 1996, Madison Park, Cardinals, um, as a tradesman, as a small business owner, we need to repair our oldest school system um, infrastructure. Uh, BPS is buildings, some of them are over 60 years old. So we need to start off first and foremost. Um, through this pandemic, we have learned how the infrastructure is crumbling and it's causing us to close schools. This is currently happening, 2022 budget. Uh, we have a lot of things that are gonna be happening uh, where we're gonna be losing schools. So we need to repair our schools and make sure we build newer schools who are eco-friendly to make sure that we use today's greatest technologies that we have at our disposal. Uh, we also want to make sure that we invest back into Madison Park. Uh, Madison is number 12 out of 14 in the state of Mass. This has been neglected for years. Uh, I, I currently sit as the co-chair um, of the alumni group, uh, and I know what we can do. We can also make sure we bring in some recovery services and treatment for the students in BPS. Uh, we also want to help small businesses across uh, Boston, especially black and brown ones, so we can get them the $8 versus 276. The wealth gap is the way that we can use um, better use this money. Thank you, Domingos. Um, so next we'll have Alex. Well, first, can I say thank God we have a federal government that is investing in people for once in the the past many years and it, you know, we'll get right into it. Education wise, we need to invest in as many pre-kindergarten seats as possible. We need modern buildings with broadband, with good heating and cooling, with arts facilities. We need gymnasiums, we need laboratories. As Aaron said, we need mental health clinicians in as many schools and health nurses. We need to invest in our workers through Madison Park. We need to help our hospitality and hotel industry that's been battered. It's made up of immigrants, people with disabilities and low wage workers. We need to invest in training for them. 
We need to invest in dedicated bike lanes, dedicated bus lanes. We need to push as much money as quickly as possible to Melia Cass into Massachusetts Avenue because it needs resources now. So I could spend about a billion dollars more if you gave me 90 seconds, but I'll stop there. Thank you, Alex. Um, next, um, last but not least, we have David. David? Yes, yeah, so with this kind of money, we need to invest with an equity lens in everything. On the education front, that means ensuring that we have universal K0 and K1, that we're supporting the shift from our current per pupil funding model to a foundational budget model so that schools can have a real basis for making their decisions on programming and how they're providing supports. In housing, we need to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to support people staying in their homes and supporting those who need it. We need to invest in our small businesses, particularly our small businesses led by black and brown individuals, by women, by members of our LGBTQIA community. We need to invest this money towards the Green New Deal, the Boston Green New Deal, and making sure that as we're making this investments in infrastructure and support for the city, that we're doing so with a lens towards the existential threat that climate change poses to the city for its future. And finally, we need to be bold and innovative and think outside the box. You know, investigating and having conversations about how we take this money and utilize it for things like a universal basic income model, that we can support those who are least among us in our city, making sure that we're providing them with an opportunity to stay, to grow, and to thrive here in the city of Boston. Thank you, David, and thank you to all the candidates for your answers in this round. Now I'm going to turn it over to Armani to get us through the next round on democracy. Hey, everyone. Um, Armani right here uh, with Right to the City Vote. I'm also an organizer with Reclaim Roxbury. Um, but today, talking about democracy, asking you all about some democracy. Um, speaking of democracy, we have over, we've had over 180 people tune into this Zoom late night Monday. Um, and that's just something to be proud of. So shout out to everyone for sticking it out and for hearing us talk about all these important topics. So for democracy, uh, for Right to the City Vote, um, we believe that our right to the city includes the right of every inhabitant to participate in decisions that shape our city, including its budget, land, development, jobs, schools, services, and our approach to public safety. And it includes the right to, inf uh, to information, transparency, popular participation, and equal representation, uh, and also to the reform of the city charter, which, um, or, which could allow us to create mechanisms for accountability and balanced legislative and executive powers. So with that being said, you know, here and how we think about democracy, we're gonna do a lightning round. And the first question that I have for you all, um, and again, remember you hit the reactions button, yes, vote uh, or no. Um, the first question is, do you support allowing non-citizens, uh, that's non-citizen residents with legal status, the right to vote in municipal elections? Okay. And can we get that one more time? Uh, Julia and Dominguez. Okay, yes. Yeah. And so Alex, we, sorry. Got it. Thank you. Awesome. So we have a yes from James Coleman, from Alex Gray, Julia Mejia, David Halbert, Domingo Sagrosa, and a no from Aaron Murphy. Okay, we have uh, another question for you all. This, this time it's going to be a deep dive. However, it's just 45 seconds, not a minute. So uh, keep it snappy, folks. This is the last round here. Um, and democracy is a very important thing. We want to hear from y'all about what changes, right? And so we know there's a brewing conversation happening right now on the city charter. Um, what changes would you prioritize to the city charter given the momentum around this opportunity? And I'm going to be starting with Aaron Murphy. So you got 45 seconds. Yes, thank you. So um, I believe as a city councilor, my role would be to rep is to represent all of the neighborhoods and all of the districts across the city. And the first one I would address would be the budget review and allowing a line item budget um, right now, you either approve the whole budget or not. And I think if you're listening to your neighbors and your constituents and they have individual needs and wants, and then you have to either say yes or no to a whole budget, it, it's not effective. Also, voter turnout. We're talking a lot tonight, too, about people's voices matter. It's one of the reasons I am running for Boston City Council to make sure that people's voices are heard. I'm a listener. So increasing voter turnout and making sure that we have more engagement and people do buy into that. Your voice matters. We want to hear from you. Let's vote. Let's represent the people that you want to have in, at City Hall speaking for you and supporting you. Thank you, Aaron Murphy. 
Thank you. Uh, next, we have James Coleman. Thank you, Armani. Um, I strongly believe that voting should be a right. And I should, as um, many people would say, we need to make sure that voter turnout is something that is part of the fabric of our city. We are living in a majority minority city where one out of four Bosnians was born somewhere else. We should take pride in voting. We should make sure that we also should, um, as a city council at large, I wanna make sure that we, the council should have a bigger say in what's happening in the city's budget, not to vote only yes or no, but to make sure that prior to presenting the budget, we work collaboratively with the mayor, whomever he or she is prior to make sure that everyone is included in what's happening. And we should all be at the center and not on the margin. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, next we have uh, Domingos De Rosa. Okay. Um, again, you know, things that we can do to the charter that we can improve the city is always something that's great for the city. Um, I would start by changing uh, some of the ordinance around um, one needle exchange, what goes on on Mass and Cass has gone on for too long. The ordinance is from 1991 and that can be, you know, looked at and, and adjusted to fit today's needs. So the city can be a little safer. We also can talk about the um, <clears throat> abutters uh, um, policy so we can make sure that the whole community is informed, not just the abutting, the abutting streets. Uh, that seems to be an issue when it comes to development all across Boston. And if we adjust those things, we can be able to actually speak um, on things like what goes, what happened on American Legion, Cummins Highway, on the dot block and so forth. So that's one thing I like to see change. I also like to make sure that the city council actually can veto online items so we can make sure that we can take and reallocate funds from departments that are heavy. You know, we have one that's at 41%, one that's at 21%. Uh, and we can make sure that we evenly distribute funds to make sure that the city is providing. Thank you, Domingo Rosa. Um, next, we have here Alex Gray. Yeah, so I'll, I'll agree with folks who mentioned the line item veto for the city council would support that. I'll reiterate my plan that was in the Boston Herald last week for a dedicated school committee seat representing the interests of the special education community. And listen, folks, uh, democracy is under attack in America. There's no doubt about it. And, you know, Boston has been and continued to be a leader on this. We need uh, no reason absentee balloting. We need early voting. It should be a celebration. We voted last year at Fenway Park. It was to vote for Joe Biden at Fenway Park was an incredible experience. Uh, the only thing I could complain about is that they weren't selling hot dogs, but we need to make it as easy as possible for people to vote in our city wherever we can. Thank you, Alex Drake. Um, next, we have David Halbert. Yes, I think if we're talking about the city charter, the first thing we have to prioritize is the budget. But I would go a step further. I think that the city council should have a fully independent budgeting authority and that they should work as a legislative body along with the mayor's office, the executive body, to come and to create real responsible budgets to bring all of our voices to the table, making sure that we're making the most robust and informed decisions as we possibly can. The budget is the most important document that comes out of city hall, where we put our money, shows what we value, and that's why we need to have as full a conversation about it as possible. I'd also be in support of making changes towards the city zoning board of appeals. I think that the proposals that came from Councillor Edwards in East Boston uh, were the right ones in terms of changing the composition of that and making sure that communities feel engaged and that they have a voice that's really being heard. Often they feel steamrolled. I think this also goes to the conversation about what we need to do about the BPDA and splitting that up into a separate planning and economic development agencies. Once again, making sure that we're empowering communities. And finally, on the voting piece, Hi. I would say that we need to re-precinct our communities as well, Hi. making sure that Thank you, David Halbert. Um, and last, but certainly certainly not least, there we go, I can say it, um, Julia Mejia. Thank you. This is the question that I love so much because all of the work that we have done is about amplifying people's voices. Um, so just to just do a quick little deep dive, our office actually filed a, a, a home rule petition to lower the voting age to give young people um, 16 and over an opportunity to actually vote. Um, we are also in support of Councilor Edwards' charter reform, which we actually had a working session today um, to amend 
the, to amend it so that we can give the council line item budget power. Uh, and we also worked with Councilor Bach's office on creating an opportunity for participatory budget processes. And if anyone's been following us, you know that we took our budget tours mm -hmm. to the streets. Um, language access, we work with the CPA, AARW, and others on our language access ordinance. We believe that that's also part of the work. And then we all hosted our first multilingual hearing on language access. We believe that the work that we've been doing in our office is has been deeply rooted in creating deep democracy. Thank you, Julia Mejia. Okay, folks, thank you for deep dive responses to that question about uh, the city charter, um, not to be confused with uh, charter schools, the city charter, the government. Okay, so now folks, last uh, closing statements. You all have 60 seconds to um, tell us about yourselves. Um, your last time with us tonight. And again, uh, over 180 folks here tonight. Um, so you're talking to a big crew folks. Um, we're gonna start with James Coleman and then we're gonna go down the list. All right, so James, take us away. Thank you so much, Armani. Thank you to all the organizers, the moderators, my fellow candidates and all of you watching tonight. I'm running for city council because I believe that we can have a better Boston for all of us. I have the drive, the compassion to make change happen, whether it's in education, technology, public safety, better services for our youth and our seniors. Bigger was everything, now it's our time, our turn to give them something. I lived in JP with my family for many years. Uh, your zip code should not determine your social status in society, right about the rich cultural aspect that, that, that is in that society, in that community, such as going to a restaurant like El Oriental de Cuba or Merengue or Ten Tables. Please consider going to my website to know more about me and my grassroots campaign. I want to listen more so that I can live better. I believe in a Boston where your income does not dictate your outcome. Please go to my website at coleman2021.com to learn more about me and my campaign. Thank you again and have a wonderful night. Thank you, James Coleman. Next, we have Domingos de Rosa. Okay. I want to thank everybody for joining us online um, on this Zoom. Again, you know, I'm, I'm just your neighbor. Um, I'm a concerned resident uh, who turned into an activist at a young age um, during, during a high gun violence in the 90s, a BPS grad um, with limited resources given at the time when the city was engulfed in, in gang violence, as they like to call it. Uh, and I've seen the city change from good to bad, and we can bring it back to that good, uh, where the city actually cared for the individuals who live here. Things that we see on Mass and Cass has shown us a lot of great concerns across the city on what goes on from mental health, substance use disorder, substance use, homelessness, our education system, economic opportunities, things that we witnessed for decades, things that we continue to conversate on, things that we can change because we deserve better as a city. I feel I'm one of those candidates that will gain access to the community to ensure that our voices are heard. I'm a candidate. Thank you, Domingo Sarosa. Um, next we have up here, uh, Alex Joy. Look, I, I don't have to tell anybody on this call that we have seen a sea change in representation here in the Boston City Council. And that has made us a better city. We are talking about things we didn't used to talk about. We're talking about the hard decisions that we have to make. But not just here in Boston, but across the country, people with disabilities are so often left out of conversations that we have in government. And, you know, more than 25% of people have disabilities in America, significantly less than 1% are made up in our elected representation. I would be Boston's first blind city councilor in only one out of two in America. So many have been hit hard by the pandemic. People with disabilities are included in that. We've got one chance to recover from this pandemic and 2021 has to be the year where people with disabilities get a seat at the table, not as a more, but not as a less, as an equal part of the conversation. And I know deep in my bones, Boston can lead on this and we can be the place that makes it happen. Thank you all, it's great. Um, next we have 
Dave Halbert. Thank you so much for having us this evening. Thank you so much to the organizers for putting this together. Once again, my name is David Halbert and I'm asking for your support to be one of your four city councilors at large. And the reason once again is because we are facing tremendous challenges in the city, whether we're talking about housing affordability, education, the impact of climate change, public safety, and a host of other issues. But I also know from my experience working in public service for over 15 years, working on the city council, what we can do from that position. If we're innovative, if we make sure that we're balancing out, bringing bold new ideas to the table, but also making sure that we're speaking to those quality of life constituent service issues. I know that work because I've done that work. That's why I'm running. That's why I'm getting up. It's to make a better city for myself, for my family, for your family, and for everyone all across the city of Boston. I hope on September 14th, I'll be able to earn your support. I hope you'll take a moment to go to our website, david the number 4 bostoncom and learn a little bit more about our platform and what it is that we're trying to do as a campaign and as a movement to build that better Boston. Thank you, David, Albert. Um, next, we have... Julia Mejia. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for hosting and creating an opportunity for us to uh, share a little bit about ourselves and our work. Um, listen, I, I am incredibly grateful for this opportunity. We won with 22,000 votes two years ago, and we were able to do a lot of great work here in the city of Boston. And I think um, there's still a lot of unfinished business to, to, um, to attend to. And for those who, who are following me, you know that our work is bold, we're loud, and we're unapologetic about the issues of equity. You know, we, we um, uh, filed an ordinance for a literacy task force because we wanted to be super mindful of our returning citizens, about students who are right now being passed from grade to grade and unable to read or write um, and being really intentional. And I think one of the things that we bring to this work is that while we're looking at the bigger picture, we're focusing on the little things that matter. So I hope to earn your vote so that I can go back and finish the work that we all started. I'm Julia um, Mejia and you can find me at juliaforboston.com. Thank you so very much for giving me the opportunity to be in community with you all. Thank you, Julia Mejia. Okay, Erin Murphy, take us away for the night. Thank you. So thank you to everyone who participated in this forum tonight. I'm glad to be here. I was born and raised in Dorchester where I've raised my children. I've been a mom for over 30 years. So I understand the challenges our children's face growing up in the city from school choices to after school opportunities, summer jobs. I'm an educator. I've spent 22 years as a classroom teacher advocating for all of the families across the city. I understand the challenges our families face trying to get a seat at a quality school. As a special education teacher and coordinator, I've worked tirelessly advocating for all of my families, making sure the children have the resources they need not just to get by and learn how to read and write, but to thrive in life, to be happy, to support their social and mental health also. I'm a community advocate. I've spent years supporting mental health and recovery outreach. Mm -hmm. I ran the Boston Marathon three times. I've raised over $50,000 for the Gavin Foundation, but not only to raise the funds, but to fight the stigma associated with mental health and addiction. I'm a mom, a teacher. I'd ask for one of your four votes in September, and please visit my website at erinforboston.com. Thank you. Thank you so much, folks. Okay, everyone, we just heard from six really awesome candidates. Hey, I think it's your turn now to close us out. Yeah, so we're nearing the end of tonight's forum, but we're really entering the very middle of the election process, the heart of it, the most important part. And the Right to the City Coalition is a multi-issue, multi-ethnic, multi-racial coalition. And we come together really to have the broadest perspective on the right fit for candidates and also to have the most impact on who we endorse. So five organizations who are part of that coalition are Boston Education Justice Alliance, Beja, Chinese Progressive Political Action, Mihente, NAACP, and JP Progressives. Those of us who can endorse are gonna do so this month and next month. For example, JPP, this Thursday, May 20th, we're gonna have a community conversation with our membership. And after that, shortly after that, we hope to be able to make an endorsement and get it out before the end of May. And so we can put our shoe leather to work to get those, those candidates who we recommend to have them elected into office. So we wanna just thank everyone who's tuned in, uh, the, the voters and the candidates. 
and we'll see you on the campaign trail. Thank you. Thank you to our interpreters. Yeah, and also our, our production team, the producers who are behind the scenes making sure this comes off as smoothly as it, as it did. And that's Zeba Cranmer, it's Rebecca, it's Christine, it's a lot of folks who really you know, worked hard to pull this off. Thank you. We Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you all so much. Really Have appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Have Thank a great night. So much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wish we could gather at Doyle's. Where's the after party? Where are we at? Where are we going? Stay <laughs> safe, everyone. Soon. <laughs> You okay. left us, Julia. You got to read it. Julia. <laughs> we missed your storefront. I know. You know. I have another one, though. <laughs> it's an announcement coming soon. OK. <laughs> We're still being recorded live, so let's not let's behave. <laughs> no, the last time.